make a minor correction. I will make a minor correction. Actually, I will be uh, talking about reproducible teaching, which is different than reproducible teaching reproducibility. And I'll talk about that, what that means. So most of the things I'm going to say today is actually in the short talk is more extended deeper in a manuscript in Chetan Karavanda when I wrote recently uh, that was published in Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. In fact, it was published, there was a special issue on reproducibility, perhaps some of you here might be interested in the whole issue. So most of the points I'm making here today are from this paper. So thinking about reproducibility, what we know from the literature about the recommendations is one, for researchers, we, uh, we say that they should adhere to reproducibility practices in their research. But many researchers are also wearing a teacher hat. They're also instructors. And we say that they should teach these skills also to their students. But in fact, there is a third dimension, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is these teacher scholars should teach while adhering to reproducibility practices in their own teaching. So. Perhaps if I give an example, it might clarify things more. So if you think of a statistics teacher scholar, perhaps they might be using R in their own research, but in their uh, classes, their students might be using graphing calculators, whereas they might be using a presentation software to prepare their teaching materials. So these are three different aspects, re uh, tools for research, tools for learning, and tools for teaching. And I'm actually focusing on the third dimension, tools for teaching. So perhaps an alternative might be, I'm coming from the R land for anyone who from Python land here. So perhaps all of these could possibly be in R, or some of them can be in Python, some of them can be in R, uh, but changing these tools to more reproducible manners might, is what I'm going to focus today. So framework for reproducible teaching is not really uh, much different than framework for reproducible research. So we say all teaching materials should be computationally reproducible, well-documented and open. If we can do this for research, why not do it for teaching as well? So for computational reproducibility, we have literate programming, so that means preparing our teaching materials, slides, handouts, and all that using literate programming. And we use a lot of data in teaching as well. And the key rule is to keep it in ROM format and then wrangle it rate later as needed. File organization is as important in teaching as well. And just like for research, if you use version control, why not use it in our teaching as well to keep track of versions of our teaching materials? And documentation part of the framework, we focus on data documentation. And since we actually try to use real data in classroom, having uh, actually some documentation of where these data were uh, received from, how they were received, and most importantly, the code book documented for the data is very important. We have many folders with slides and data and all these. Having folder documentation is as important, usually, uh, done with readme files and also changing software from uh, term to term uh, even if we don't change our software actually uh, the software changes itself so well documenting documenting these software versions well in our teaching is as important and the last item we have in documentation is style guides and you might be surprised, perhaps I'm including this here and we've included in our paper, possibly using style guide does not necessarily make uh, teaching materials reproducible, but having a style guide actually makes reproducibility easier as it makes coding, uh, uh, reading codes, as well as finding files much easier. And the third dimension is openness. If we advocate for having open research materials, we can do the same for teaching as well. Uh, having course websites and having materials on these, hosted on these websites is very important. And for open teaching materials, there are two important aspects instructors might uh, think about. One is licensing their materials, perhaps Creative Commons licenses might be appropriate. And the other one is where to host this. And some options are GitHub pages, Netlify, and possibly for course websites also 
local university servers and university websites might also be helpful as well. So just to give an example, um, I teach an introductory data science class, not in London, but in my Irvine appointment. And all the teaching materials of this web, uh, of this course is posted on introdata.science website. And students actually, just like any public, uh, any instructor in the public could access this website, my students also access the course materials from this website as well. And just to give, uh, so the framework is rather large, but I'll just give a sneak peek into some examples from the framework by showing one folder uh, from a hypothetical course that could possibly be introductory data science. So in this folder, for instance, we have the folder is called week 11 simple lean reg, which implies that possibly this is taught in the 11th week of the term. And the topic is simple linear regression. And we, it actually has an R project file. So this is the project based workflow that has managing files between instructors and possibly TAs uh, easier as well. Of course, the folder is documented with a readme file. And then there are three subfolders within the folder, data, lectures, and quizzes. The data is also documented with a readme file, and there are data files. And then once we move on to lectures, we can see that lecture, name, lecture file names start with LEC to indicate they are lectures. And then we have the enumeration of 11A, 11B, and 11C for these files. This actually indicates that this is a week 11 uh, material. And we have the alphabetical uh, styling of ABC. Perhaps this course is taught on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, but we do not use MWF because we want these file names to be alphabetically in order. So ABC perhaps indicates the lecture order much better. And file names also indicate what that lecture is about. So we do see simple linear regression indicator, variables, and assumptions. And when we move on to the quizzes uh, section of these materials, we see that lecture 11A aligns well with quiz 11A as well. So this is just one sneak peek into a reproducible teaching material. Of course, when we think about the toolkit of the instructors specifically for a course like this, perhaps the instructor might indicate or oh, they're preparing their teaching materials with R, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The toolkit includes many other tools such as R Markdown, GitHub, and possibly instructor also knowing HTML and some CSS as well. And I like that Ron mentioned the switch to Quarto. I just wanted to be honest here. All these materials were developed with R Markdown and I'm gradually changing to Quarto one course at a time. So the current course I'm teaching has switched to Quarto, but not this course. <laughs> So perhaps some few notes to make before I finish. Uh, why should we care about reproducible teaching just like we care about reproducible research? One of them is if you consider a typical undergraduate student and how much research exposure they get is a question mark. Some students get to work with their professors, but many of them don't get to work with their professors one on one. So in order for them to actually see reproducible practices done by their professor, teaching is one way we can show them. And in fact, this is a good role modeling and it does come up a lot in my classes. I, when I provide my students my own slides, like the source code is linked from the course website and I show them how they can find the source code for the slides, for instance, and they get to the final projects uh, at the end of the term. And many of the time, many pro group projects actually have some features of uh, making slides in Sheringen. I've never shown them, but they actually go and copy or look at my slide source code and see how I've done it. And they actually take that as an example. Uh, also reproducible to practices in teaching have high impact on course management too. I don't know how many different tools you use in your courses, but I did have a, a semester where I had too many, more than I would like. <laughs> Uh, my students were doing their work on our studio cloud back in the day when it was free. <laughs> and uh, they were pushing their work to GitHub. I was hosting these website uh, materials on GitHub. 
they were doing discussions on Piazza and my school used Canvas for learning management system. And I have hundreds of students in my classes. So you can imagine how many folders I have to manage. My, I have to manage also multiple TAs. Uh, they manage the course work as well. So having some actual consistency in file naming, uh, having nice readme files helps my students not to get lost, my TAs not get lost, and my staff not to get lost. So it makes course management a lot more easier than other versions, I think. And we, it's teaching is impactful in many ways, but also we can extend that impact if you make consider the openness of teaching materials. So I don't know how you start teaching a new course, but my first go to place is other people's courses. So I always appreciate other people's open materials, even if it's just a syllabus to be honest, just to give an idea of what other people are doing to make sure I'm not doing the wrong thing. Uh, so it's always good to have our impact reach wider than our classroom, I believe. And when we talk about reproducible teaching, we are not necessarily talking about what the student is doing. We are talking about what the instructor is doing. So no matter what we are teaching to the students, it could be a more mathematical course like probability, where students maybe don't even touch R. I mean, they would in probability, but possibly. So we can still, as an instructor, use these reproducible teaching uh, practices in our own teaching. And all of this is a lot of tools. And if somebody is new to reproducible teaching, perhaps it can be overwhelming. Uh, but there's perhaps a better approach to this rather than trying to take all reproducible teaching framework at once, actually taking it one step at a time. So we actually recommend instructor, instructors to make incremental changes from one academic term to the next. Perhaps one uh, term, the instructor might prepare materials using literate programming. Next term, they can do literate programming and version control. And perhaps one dif distinction to make between reproducible research and reproducible teaching is in reproducible research, we do want to arrive at the same answer, but in reproducible teaching, we don't necessarily want to carbon copy. So there is also cultural context, but when we share these materials with other uh, instructors around the world, they can adopt it to their cultural context, but they can, of course, change the data to their own the students' interest or so on. So it's not really a carbon copy case in that in this framework. And that's all the points I wanted to make today. So thank you. <laughs>